Hi, my name is Jim Lamb. I'm the program manager for the Team Foundation Server product unit. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through the configuration of the Team Foundation Server release candidate for 2010. And in this case, we're going to be installing on Windows 7, which is, of course, a client operating system. So we're going to be using the basic configuration of TFS. And this is great if you just want to be able to use source control, work on tracking, and build automation. Uh, and you want to use SQL Express as your database. Uh, and we'll actually use the instance that I've already installed. It uh, was installed by Visual Studio. Uh, this is not a great choice if you want to be able to leverage SharePoint or SQL reporting services integration. Those are not supported in this mode. But this is really useful if you just want to try out TFS or if you want to use it as a, a local store. So I'm going to start at the wizard, and you'll see there aren't a whole lot of options here. We're going to tell it to use our existing SQL Express instance. And it's actually found it. It's right there, the Jibla MT400 SQL Express. I'm going to test this just to make sure we have connectivity, and we do. That's great. Now I'm going to go ahead and do our readiness checks. That all looks great. So I'm told to go ahead and configure my Team Foundation server instance. So it's going to go ahead and create the databases for the server. And there's basically two databases that get created for a new TFS, TFS instance. One is the configuration database, and the next one is the project collection database. So if you're familiar with older versions of TFS, uh, there were actually a number of databases. There were actually, there was actually one database per kind of functional area yeah. and then per team project. So there was a... Uh, for example, a database for version control, work time tracking, and build, and so on. There were actually a total of about seven. And there was one of those for each team project that you created. So you had quite a few databases to manage, to, to back up and restore, and so on. With 2010, it's much simpler. You get one project collection database. The uh, configuration database is global to your TFS uh, deployment. So you can actually have multiple project collections all, that all use that same configuration database. Each project collection can in turn have some number of team projects. And that's pretty much constrained by uh, you know, the, how heavy duty your database server is. So in this case, this is my laptop, so not a very heavy duty database server, but uh, sufficient for the, this demonstration for sure. You'll see it is taking a little while to configure those databases. And uh, the next thing it'll do when it's finished with that is to set up a website. And there are actually uh, sort of logically two separate websites for TFS. One is the web services layer, and that is a set of SOAP web services that are used by the client to communicate with the server. And those run in IS. And, uh, they're not uh, kind of user-facing, so they're not something you would log into directly. But there is also the web access front end, which is uh, set up for your TFS instance and will allow you to access all the things you can access from Visual Studio from any browser, pretty much any modern browser, I should say. So it's now setting up the website. You know, that used to be a, a separate add-on in 2008, the web access module. But of course, since we acquired uh, TS Team System Web Access, we've integrated it completely into the product, and that's uh, now one install. And once it finishes up with the website, it's going to configure services, and probably the main one you want to be aware of there is the uh, TFS job agent, and it's a service that runs in the background. It's a Windows service, and it takes care of kind of all the background tasks that Team Foundation Server needs to do on a regular basis. So things like synchronizing users with your domain if you're running in a domain context, um, enforcing retention policies for your builds, uh, and a number of other things that all happen on a schedule in the background. So. It's doing that now. 
And once this part of the process is complete, the last thing will be to create a default project collection. And again, that'll have uh, one physical database to store all of that project collection data. And that, again, can be a number of team projects, uh, each with you know, version control, work item tracking, and build automation services. And that way you can keep those all encapsulated in that one physical database. So when you do need to take a backup or restore a backup or move it off to a new uh, SQL server, you can do that pretty easily. Installing the Windows services, so it's got a little ways to go yet. Okay, now it's creating the initial project collection, and but this is named Default Collection um, by this wizard, just so you're aware, and that name will show up in several places, so. It's good to be aware of it. You see there are a number of steps there. Now it's not going to create any team projects yet, just the project collection, which is a container essentially for uh, your team projects, your first set of team projects. And you can create multiple project collections on one TFS instance. It's just going to create one project collection to get you started. But that's a pretty uh, strong boundary. So project collections, you know, because they're meant to be somewhat standalone, you, know, you can't you can't for instance create change sets that span project collections. You can't create work items that link to work items in other project collections and so on. So it's a, a pretty hard isolation boundary. So it's certainly something that's useful, but if you do have related projects and you want to be able to have uh, you know, change sets that span those projects and so on, you do probably want to keep those in a single project collection. And you'll see we are actually getting close to the end here. Okay, and configuration is complete. Everything looks good. You'll see it did add a firewall exception for port 8080, which is the default port the Team Foundation server listens on. And we can take a look at the complete uh, log if we want. You can also take a look at the uh, two websites here that got created, but I'm going to save that for later. Go ahead and close out our configuration wizard.